But today I want to start with what I think is something that's very close to the heart of God. Let me ask you this question. What is your first response to a world that is far from God? What is your first response to a world that is far from God? It doesn't take living in this world very long to go, it's a little messed up, right? Like, it's just something's a little off. Like, for example, if you've been around for the past couple weeks, you know that our government had a little conversation about aliens. Can we just acknowledge this? Can we just acknowledge that our government had a conversation about aliens? And if they would have had this conversation in the 90s, you know what would have happened? A lot of different things than what happened over the past two weeks. If you would have said this in the 90s, we would have called Scully and Mulder up. We would have had something solved real quick, right? Some of you, you would have pulled out your collection of goosebumps, and you're like, okay, I read this one. I know what's going down in this situation, right? Tales from the Crypt. Some of y'all, I know. I know you watch some of these things. But it would have been a whole different situation. We would have figured out Will Smith's personal phone number. We'd have been like, I need you to leave Chris Rock alone. I need you to go slap an alien real quick. But I think it's very telling of what's happening in our world. Their government talked about aliens, and we're like, ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody nobody got time for that. Like, there's too much going on in my world. There's too much going on in the world. Like, this world's just messed up, y'all. And I think that that should say something to us. And in a way... It shows how desensitized we have become to a world that is far from God. And we should never become desensitized to people that are far from God. Our hearts should be moved by it. So what is our, what's our first response to a world that is far from God? What do, what do we do first? Do we, do we come at the world and just point fingers of accusation? You're wrong about this and you're wrong about that and you need to stop doing this and, and stop doing that. Now, there's probably a time and a place for those types of things. But I think that there's somewhere that we have to start. Somewhere very biblical that we begin And we find this advice from the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy, this young pastor. And this is what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and through 4. He says, I urge, I urge them, first of all, look at somebody around you say, first of all. I'm so proud of y'all. Some of y'all, y'all did not want to say a word, but you did it anyways, right? The Lord gave you strength. But first of all, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Paul's saying, however you pray, there's all kinds of ways to pray. All of them, all of them need to be made for all people. And then he even singles out a a, a few that sometimes we overlook. He says, let's also do it for the kings and all of those in authority. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives. See, is, and, he, and I love what he goes to in this. It's not that we live peaceful and quiet lives because we tune out the world. We live peaceful and quiet lives because we prayed for the world. And we experience godliness in our culture and holiness in the lives of those around us. He says, this is good. FYI, this is good. This is good. It's like somebody made something for, good for you, and you're like, yeah, this is good. I think I can eat a little bit. God's going, this is good that you pray for all people. It pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's a picture into the heart of God in this moment as Paul 
is giving us these instructions, right? When you look into this world and you go, man, it is so far from God, what do I do? Pray first. Pray first. Pray first. And especially when the lost world isn't just a group of people, but when that lost world is your brother, and it's your child, it's your aunt, it's your grandparent. What do you do? What do you do when it's people that are close to you, but they're far from God? You pray first. You pray first. There's a lot of things to do, but the first thing we do is we pray. See, prayer is our first response to a lost world. Our first response. It's powerful. It changes things. It changes us. It changes the world around us. Prayer is not just words just that are recited to God, but it is something that God has invited us into in relationship with Him that produces change in the world around us. So we pray first. Now I understand that some of us, we feel ill-equipped to be able to pray. Well, that's why we're leaning in in this series to equip us to know how to pray. If we're honest, some of us doubt that prayer actually changes things. Well, I'm here to renew some hope in your life that it really does. That it really does. And some of us, we, we, we're going, yeah, maybe it does, but shouldn't I, shouldn't I do this? Shouldn't I say this? Like, shouldn't... Prayer should just kind of be like second, third, or fourth on the list. Like, there's some things I got to get out there. I got to be aggressive. I got to solve these problems. I got to save these people. Like, there's, there's plenty to do to love and to serve and to help a lost world. But I believe, and according to 1 Timothy, first of all, we should pray. First of all, we should pray pray it's got to become something that comes from our heart right it's not just a messed up world we live in but it's someone that we know and we cherish and we love that we want to experience the love of God like when I came into a relationship with Jesus it changed so much in my life I don't I don't want I don't want anyone close to me to not experience that same love. I remember several years ago, I was able to take my family to Panama City Beach, Florida. Anybody been to the Panama City Beach? Raise your hand. We're proud, proud. I know you don't want to do it proud, but come on. We know like the Lord forgives whatever happened in Panama City Beach, Florida. Just don't go do it again, okay? But I, I, I took my family to Panama City Beach. Uh, my aunt has a condo there, and I called her. I was like, hey, uh, we got a little free, little free family, little family discount, right? And so we went down there, and if you've ever been there, it's been there for decades. There's this maze, and uh, it's this awesome maze. So I take my family in there, and, and there's this, this board with all the times. Who could get through this maze the fastest? They give you this little punch card because there's four towers in this maze. And you have to run through the maze, go up to each tower, punch your card, and go to the next tower, punch that card, and get all four towers punched. And then you get to the end, and it shows that you went through everything, right? So I, I'd take off because I'm, I'm an achiever, y'all. Like, I got to do it. I got to win. I'm all about doing it faster than other people. That kind of stuff. I take off. I am solving this maze. It was like the Lord had set me up divinely for this moment. I I'm, I'm get to that tower. And I, I had this moment where I go, you know what? I, I, I mean, I could easily beat this record. <laughs> right? <laughs> Humbly. Humbly beat this record. But then I'm also a father, and I got kids going through this maze, and I'm kind of like, 
this is not going to be fun if I get to the end of this maze and I got to spend four hours trying to figure out where my children are in this maze and find them in a corner crying because their dad deserted them. And so part of my strategy was not just to get through that maze, but to get my family through the maze. And so when I got to a tower, I'd look and I would see where people were and I would go, hey, no, 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 that's heading to a dead end. You need to turn around and you need to, you need to go back a little bit. Now take a left and guide them through that maze so that we could do it together. And there were a few times it wasn't because of my lack of communicating skills. I'm just... I, for some reason, they just the left didn't make sense to them. And so, so I was like, you know, I'm going to come down. Just stay there. I'm going to come down. I'm going to find you. We're going to do this together. We're going to walk through. We're going to get you to the place you need to go. See, when we look into our world and we see a lost world, when we look into our family, when we look into our friends, when we look into our coworkers and and fellow students' lives, and we see people that are far from God, we have to stop and look back and say, I want you at the finish line with me. I want you to go on this journey with me. And where we start in that journey is through prayer. Is we, we pray for the people that are close to us but far from God. You go, okay, well, how do I pray? What do, what do I do? Today, I simply want to walk you through a prayer model, uh, so to speak. How do you pray for people that are close to you but far from God? How, what do you say? How, how, does this, how does this make any difference? How does this shift anything? Because what's important to know is that you can't solve spiritual problems with just physical tactics. You have to engage in a spiritual world with spiritual tools to be able to solve a spiritual problem. So let's jump in. Let's talk about it. How do we pray for those who are far from God? Here's the first thing. You need to ask the Father to draw them to Jesus. Ask the Father to draw them to Jesus. Here, here's what Jesus said in his own words in John 6, 44. He said, no one. So I'm figuring when Jesus says no one, he's talking about nobody, right? He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is an important truth to know, not just in how to pray, but also how to approach the lost people in your life. It's, it's valuable to accept personal responsibility. But you have to understand at the end of the day, you can't save anybody. You can't. It is the drawing of the Father through the Holy Spirit that happens in a person's life and them being receptive and responsive to the Lord pulling them close to him. That's it. That's it. Now, there's things that the Lord may have you to do or to say at times to be a part of that process. But at the end of the day, you can't save anyone. And if you did, then their salvation is built on some rocky foundation. He said... No one can come to the Father unless He draws them. No one can come to the Son and say He draws them. So we pray. We pray. Every week I pray, God, I pray that you would just wake people up. Even on Sunday morning. So this morning we prayed in our prayer service. We, God, I pray that as people are waking up, you just stir in their hearts. Draw them. Draw them to you. That they would meet you in their kitchen, meet you in their living room, meet you in their bedroom. They'd meet you. God, even if you, if you need to use a church, God, draw them. God, use Google. Use Facebook. Use a text message. Use a friend. Use a carrier pigeon. I don't use something. Draw them, Lord. Draw them. 
by your spirit, I know that the Lord is drawing people all over this city. I, I believe that there's somebody in this room, maybe a few, that the Holy Spirit has been drawing you to him. And you're here because you are slowly responding to his pull. Somebody's watching online. You're here because the Holy Spirit's drawing you. We partner in this process when we begin to pray for those that are far from God by praying. God, draw them, draw them, draw them to you. Now, if this is the heart of God, then why aren't 100% of people saved? Right? If, if God is drawing all men and women to him, if God is drawing all people to him, then why are not all people walking in relationship with God? Because there's that component where they have to respond. They have to respond. Well, why don't they respond? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you think it would be logical if the creator of the universe is drawing somebody to him, why wouldn't they respond? Well, you and I know because maybe it's in your own story as well. Oftentimes, there's a lot of junk that builds up in our life and prevents us from being able to see clearly. Past hurts and pain. Bad theology. Things that people have done, things churches have done. A lot of things can build up. Which is why the second thing that we need to pray is not just that the Spirit draws them, but we actually need to stand in some authority that God has given us, and we need to bind the Spirit that blinds their minds. And you go, where did you get that phraseology? It comes from the Scriptures. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. It says, the God of this age, this is a term that's often referred to as to the devil, to Satan. The, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. See, often it's not a knowledge problem that keeps people from coming to Jesus. It's a sight issue. Have you ever driven in such a thick fog that you can barely see in front of you? Like there's a part of you that you're like, do I just stop? But then part of you, like, if I stop, someone else is just going to run into me. Like, I, how do I drive? I can't, I can't even see. You ever been like in a hotel or someone else's house in the middle of the night and it's just pitch black and you wake up and you got to go to the bathroom the older you get the more common that kind of story happens but anyways you, you're in a, a in a strange place you wake up in the middle of the night and it's just so dark and you're just trying to navigate your way through through things and you just bump into furniture and you're like man my knee was already hurting because i'm over 40 why did i need to run into something being blind makes it hard to navigate. And oftentimes, people in this world do not realize that they have a spiritual blindness. But when, when those of us who've seen the light, when those of us who've come into relationship with Jesus and know the truth and know the freedom and know the relationship, we know those things... Like, we stand on the authority of Jesus and we go, I, I bind that spirit. Jesus gave us the authority to bind that spirit, to have it. Go, no, you, you're going to stop blinding them. You're going to stop coming against them. You're going to stop preventing them from seeing. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will let you know the things that are blinding them. I, I, that, that spirit of rejection that they have. Where they're experienced with just religion that just bore down on them. I pray freedom from that. Pray that they would have eyes to see the scales would fall off. And then the third thing we pray is we pray that they seek a relationship with God. A relationship with God. 
Because you'll notice that when we pray that we would bind the spirit that blinds them, it's we're, the thing that blinds them from seeing the light, the gospel, the, the light of the glory of Jesus Christ, the image of God. We're not trying to convert people to a certain religious set of rules. We're introducing people to their creator who loved them so much that he gave his one and only son to die on a cross for our sins so that there was no barrier anymore and we could be in relationship with him. I love these words of Paul to the Roman church in Romans 8, 15. He said, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you slave again to fear. He said, but you received a spirit of sonship. And it uses that word sonship because especially in that day and age, the sons were the ones where the inheritance was passed on to. And it's saying, whether you're a son or a daughter of the Most High King, you have a, received a spirit with full inheritance, and by that you're able to cry out to Him, Abba, Father. You're able to have this close relationship. He's not just a creator. He's not just the one that was the divine design beyond this world. No, He's a Father that loves you, made you, we pray that over people. I pray, I pray not that they would just know the truth. I pray that they would know the one who is truth. God, I pray. I pray that they would be drawn to a relationship, to seek that relationship with you. The fourth thing that I pray for those that are far from God is that believers would cross their path. Believers would cross their path. God, I pray, I pray that you would give them a waiter that represents you. Or if they're a waiter, them, so I pray that you would send a believer that actually knows how to tip. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> Some of y'all need to write that down. Because I used to wait tables, and I know, I know. Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Anyway, but Lord, I pray that you would send people. They work at the grocery store, and I pray you would just send somebody through their line full of the Holy Spirit to just speak life into them and speak truth into them. God, I pray they're moving, and they're moving into a new apartment. I pray that you would give them a neighbor that knows you and shows up with such hospitality and such love that they have an instant friend that can point them to you. God, I pray that you would give them a co-worker. I pray that you would put them this year when they go into school. I pray that they would have someone sit right next to them in class. And you would just line up every class. Every class. They're just next to that person. And that person would have the words to say and the ways to love that would point them to Jesus. God, send them. Send them. Jesus said this way. In Matthew 9, 38, he said, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. In that same context, he said, The harvest is plentiful. Which means there's a lot of people that the Holy Spirit is drawing and they're opening their heart to him. But he said, The workers are few. So I pray God send them but there's an aspect, as soon as that comes out of my mouth, I have to also say, send me. Send me. Let, let me be the person that goes through the line at Kroger. And instead of me being preoccupied with which candy I'm going to get, right? I'm going, Lord, is, do I have a word for this person? A word of encouragement, a word of truth. Can you use me in this moment? When I go out to eat at the restaurant, I'm going, Lord, maybe I'm the one that could bring joy and hope and answer to prayer into this person's life. And maybe I'm the student that sits next to that other person. Maybe I'm the coworker that, that decides to utilize my break time to engage in some conversations that could lead to life change in someone's life. Maybe I'm the send me. 
It's in me. One of the things that you'll learn when you go to Next Steps is we are a church that is about stepping out and serving other people. And we want to connect you, whether it's to serve groups that are going out and serving in our community, or it's teams that are serving people throughout the week and on Sundays. We want to equip you to say, send me and then find that place that the Lord just wired you for to make a difference. And finally, you need to pray that they receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. This was Paul's prayer. In Ephesians 1.17, this is the way he prayed. He said, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that you would just, and that word know, it's this Greek word gnosko, which means this like intimate knowing, this knowing that you know, the kind of knowing that you, you ever known somebody that you're like sitting across the, the table from each other, you're sitting in class with them, you don't even have to say a word, you just make eye contact and instantly you know what's funny. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got that connection. You're like, we, we went out to eat for lunch the other day. It was uh, my wife and I and just a couple of our kids. And there was something happening at the table behind us. I'm not going to go into it because the Lord just, he deals with my heart with judgment. But there was something happening. And all of a sudden, my son and I, we just, we just knew. And we just, we vibrated. Just like for about five minutes, we were just... Just trying to hold it together, trying to, like, come on, Lord, like, let me just erase it from my brain, but I can't, but we just knew, we just knew. Like, there was a closeness. That's what Paul is praying, that you would know, that you would have that spirit of wisdom and revelation. You would just know. God is such a personal God. He is such a real God. He's not a God of the past. He's not a God that I need to convince you came and, and lived on this earth 2,000 years ago. It's Jesus. I, I don't, he did all of those things, and he's also present in your life today. And he's present in other people's lives today. So what do we do? What do we do with a world that's lost? Well, I look at my bracelet. Ah, there it is. Pray first. I pray first. Start praying for them. Holy Spirit, draw them. Holy Spirit even put something. I, I, that paint, that thing that that church did to them that one time, I pray that you would release them and free them from that so that they could just see you clearly. I pray that they would just seek a relationship with you. Seek a relationship with you. God, send me, send others, send whoever. God, to cross their path and help them come to know you. I pray that they would just know you in such a close and an intimate way. This is how we pray for people that are far from God. I want you to know if you're in this room and if you're watching online and you go, I'm, I'm kind of far from God right now. This is what we've been praying for you. This is what we've been praying for you. And in just a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity right where you are to just pray. Step into a relationship with Jesus today. A relationship that changes everything. Everything. I've had all kinds of people in my life that I've had this burden for. You know, there's been seasons in my life I didn't always just work in a church. Like I said, I've waited tables. I worked at Staples. You're welcome. You got organized, right? You got your Staples. I've worked in offices with cubicles and group homes for, for boys. I've worked at Chick-fil-A. Hey! I know how to make that Christian chicken, y'all. No, I think I got that recipe figured out a little bit. But peanut oil is a little expensive, so I ain't buying that. So, 
so I had to pray this prayer often. I remember years ago, my grandfather would, had really just taken a turn for the worse. And he was somebody that had always been on my heart, even though when I was, when my parents got divorced when I was six, we actually went and lived in my grandparents' house for the next six years, my, my two older brothers and my mom and I. And we would go to this, this older Methodist church as a family. And so I saw that, but there was just a lot of other things that I saw, too, that just made me wonder, like, I, does he know Jesus? Does he have a relationship with Jesus? And I remember when, when his health had really taken a turn, I just I started praying for him in these ways. And I remember at some point the Lord was like, I need you to call him. And I was like, this is going to be awkward. It's going to be awkward, Jesus. Just going to be honest with you. It's going to be a little awkward, Jesus. He said, I need you to call him. And I called my grandfather up. And I said, listen, I, I, I've seen you go to church. I've seen the Our Daily Bread thing in the bathroom. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all seen that. That, that's a, that was a whole other generation. Spending time with the Lord on the throne. New meaning to approaching the throne room, right? I'm a boy. I'm a, somewhere inside of here, just still a middle school boy living, just being real with you. So I've seen these things, but I, I just don't know. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Like, have you given your life to him? And I talked through that with him, and he, he said, yes, yes, I've, I've done that. It was hard, but there was a peace and a reassurance afterwards. Listen, I've missed some of those moments right? where maybe it was the right thing at the wrong time or, or maybe I never took the time. And I just want to encourage you, whatever you found in Jesus, let's make sure we share it with the world around us. Think about even those first disciples. As soon as they realized who Jesus was, there was just something that shifted. You see in John chapter 1, verse 40 and 42, it talks about Andrew and his brother Peter. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two that heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus and the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah. It's another word for Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. I think that we can start with prayer by bringing people to Jesus and bringing Jesus to them. And we're sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life when, when we physically bring them. And I want you to know that this is a safe place for you to bring anybody that is far from God. There's no assigned seats in here. So they're not going to come in and somebody be like, I'm sorry, you're sitting in my seat. No, you, no, you're not. No, you're not. There's no assigned seat. They can bring the drink in, the coffee in. They can... In fact, when the day you bring somebody with you that doesn't know Jesus is the day you start appreciating everything that we do as a church even more. Because if we can do nothing else as a church but help people find Jesus, that's enough. Thankfully, we can also help people become disciples of Jesus once they've found him. But let's never lose sight when we look at a lost world of seeing them be found. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Holy Spirit, we just welcome. We welcome you into our life. I ask even for myself and for everyone in this room that you would just begin to bring to our mind 
people that are close to us that don't know you. Maybe there's some people we just haven't even thought about before, but they, we work with them, we go to school with them, we, we live down the street from them. Now bring them into our heart, bring them to our mind. We can start praying for them, praying your will over their life. God, we're going to pray first. We're going to pray life change. We're going to pray that they would know you like we know you. So we welcome you to just bring that list to us. God, we're going to accept responsibility for praying, believing, change for them. With every head bowed for just a moment longer, maybe you're here and you go, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I, I know what you're talking about when you say he draws us. I feel that. I feel that tug. I want you to know you don't have to know everything. You don't have to know everything to step into a relationship with Jesus. There's a lot he will teach you from being in a relationship with him. But I'll tell you this. You need to know a few crucial things. That God loves you. and He loved you so much that he didn't want the barrier of your sin to separate you from him anymore. And, and even though the cost of that sin was death, he was willing to send Jesus here to pay that price for you. So what do you do? You accept that gift of salvation, that gift of freedom, that gift of love, that gift of grace. And with it, you get a fresh start, a new beginning to approach God without a barrier, free to be in relationship with Him. So I want to lead you in a prayer right where you are. If you're ready to start a relationship with Him, pray with me something like this. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my hopes, my dreams. I give you my failures, my mistakes, and my sins. I know in your hands they are all taken care of. I trust you with my life. I respond. I respond to the drawing that you have been doing in my life, drawing me to you, drawing me back to you. And I commit my life to you, to following you. Teach me, lead me, guide me. I thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for this fresh start, this new beginning. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, church, just celebrate anybody who prayed that prayer this morning. Amen. 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 Would you stand with me? In the next few minutes, I think some really powerful things can happen. There's all kinds of ways that you can respond to what the Lord's been doing in your heart today and respond to what he was doing even before you even arrived today. And I want you to step into those. In the back of the room, there's places you can take cards and write things and pin them to the cross. There's communion elements there. But there's one really special thing that's going to happen in the next few minutes. Our prayer team, they're going to come gather on the front sides of the stage. In fact, guys, you can go ahead and get in place. And here's what I want to happen in the next few minutes. As you worship and as you declare the goodness of God over your life, our prayer team is going to be down here. At minimum, I would love for you just to bring those names of lost loved ones, people that are close to you that don't know Jesus, and just partner in prayer and just say, will you help me pray for Janet? Will you help me pray for Tom? Will you help me pray for Darius? Will you help me pray? Will you help me pray for them? And, and y'all just partner in prayer. But also, I just believe that there's some things that were burning in some of your hearts on the way here to church. Some things that you were just like, God, I just don't know. I don't know if I can forgive. I don't I don't know if I can believe you for that. I don't know if you can restore that relationship. I don't know if you can do it. It's time to come down and get prayer. 
And I, and I just want to even say this to the worship team. Any of you guys, if you feel like you need prayer, just during this time, feel free to come down and receive prayer. Okay? So God, we just set aside this moment to you. We believe that prayer changes things, and we're ready to step into that, to offer our prayers up to you, our response to your revelation in our life. God, and I pray that you'd anoint these prayer team members, God, as they pray over people's names and lives and situations, that there would be a powerful move of God. Pray this in Jesus' name.